Hello, welcome to another episode of the Breakthrough Real Estate Investing Podcast. I am your, your solo host for the day, Sandy McKay. And of course, Rob is not here today, but we, uh, we miss him dearly and his perspectives here and insights. Uh, he is doing an amazing retreat uh, at the moment with some of his, his core group of investors and friends and partners in Costa Rica. So we're letting him hang out there for the day with the group. And um, hopefully they're taking action, buying some fun properties and having fun together. Uh, we are here to keep the show rolling and provide lots of value for you. We've got an amazing show. I'm excited for our guest, Matt Christie, to come. And we're going to be talking about real estate investment funds, which is something we have not dove too deep on on this show in the past. And uh, it's something I'm really excited about. So hang tight with us. We're going to get into that interview very shortly. And before we do that, as always, want to recommend and remind everyone to go over to our, our website, BreakthroughREIPodcast.ca where you can pick up our free gift, the ultimate strategy for building wealth through real estate. And of course, when you do that, you'll get on our email list and never miss out on a show or an update or uh, webinars or whatever we got going on. You will uh, stay up to date with all that stuff. So go over and do that again, breakthroughreipodcast.ca. And remember to leave us a review. We love when we hear from our guests, our, 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 our listeners, our, uh, our followers, and we would love some recommendations on what you want to hear from us, what kind of guests you want us to bring on. Uh, we really do our best to read through every single one of those and bring on a guest that you want to hear so we can provide the type of value that you're looking for. And uh, yeah, so go over and do that. Apple is a great place to do that. iTunes uh, is a place to go over and leave us some reviews. Five-star ratings are always recommended and, uh, and appreciated. Helps us get out there in front of all the great Canadians that listen to our show and it helps get us to the top of the list so we can attract the best guests, provide the best content and ultimately create the best experience. So that's about it for the housekeeping. Um, like I said, it's just me today. And so a little less to talk about up front. I do want to introduce, um, before we get to our guest, Matt here, I want to introduce um, on our past show, Rob was asking me about a couple of things that, uh, that I've been doing lately, which is involved. Uh, it has involved a real estate investment fund that uh, a group of us have put together that's really exciting and something we're going to be talking about uh, with our guests here on the show today. And um, so we're going to get into all the detail details of it. Uh, I will just um, start out by saying that uh, we're really excited about it. There's a lot of things that I've done in the last uh, 18 months that have led to this and uh, really restructuring our investment strategies and really focusing on, like we always have, the value add approach, um, doing some bigger, more exciting deals. And I'm really excited to say and share that we can uh, allow a lot more people to be involved in what we're doing. And so there's a lot of opportunities if you're looking to reach out, if you're looking to get involved with the deals that we're a part of and you want to learn more about that, um, I can certainly talk on it and help you out. You can always reach out to me, uh, Sandy at freedomrevs.com or throughout any social media channels. Or we can also talk you could also talk with our awesome guest who we've got coming on the show here with us uh matt christie so matt welcome to the show well thanks for having me pleasure to be here uh, so i'll read a brief bio here and uh, and matt is one of our our partners in the fund and so we're going to get into all the details of that he's got a great history in, in in running and managing real estate investment funds and um his bio is that he is a residential and commercial real estate portfolio he's built a residential and commercial real estate portfolio from the ground up Rapidly scaling from zero to 365 rental units in 10 years. He's got a uh, portfolio of 115 million under management. He's actually a chartered accountant with PwC or was a chartered accountant with PW, PwC. And he found his full-time passion in real estate in 2011 when he started investing in beautiful Hamilton, Ontario. And Matt has since used his financial acumen to assemble dozens of off-market property acquisitions while raising tens of millions of dollars under various strategic corporate structures. Matt's an experienced real estate de uh, investor, developer, and licensed realtor who recently passed as exempt market dealer. Might ask you a bit about what that means. Just recently passed that, uh, that course. And he assembles profitable investments for his partners with a specialized eye for hidden market opportunities. Simultaneously, Matt owns a property management company. He's a managing partner for several limited partnerships, active member of multiple business improvement districts, and maybe quite, uh, quite the feat on top of all that is that he is a proud husband and father of, of four beautiful kids. So busy life, lots of stuff going on there, Matt. Um, why don't you, why don't you share with us how all that got put together and kind of what your investment journey has been like so far? 
Yeah, thank you for the intro. Um, I like how you added that. I'm a proud father uh, and husband at the end there. I always I always uh, state that. So thank you for bringing that to attention. It's actually the forefront of everything that I do. Um, how I got started in real estate. Um, if I had to define a moment, it was actually in, in university. You know, uh, I had a landlord at the time who, for some reason, always wanted to come pick up his uh, check in person, um, always late, which I didn't understand. He was, you know, um, a calm, relaxed individual in his late 40s. And I found out he just wanted to sit down and have a beer with me, uh, which one day I finally asked him, you know, what is it that you do? Like, like why are you here on a Wednesday afternoon? Um, offering to sit outside and have a beer with me. And he simply just pointed to a property across the street, one, two doors down, a laundromat, and said, you know, I own these uh, student rentals, and that's it. And the light bulb went off. You know, the, the option of having passive income, um, it attracts me at that time. Um, so from there, um, you know, I actually, that uh, year, I was already doing an internship with PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was in school for accounting and economics. And so I was able to scrap, uh, scrape together $5,000 and buy a condo uh, while I was in university, uh, University of Ottawa. You know, 5% down, 5000 I, I bought a two-bedroom condo for just over $100,000. Um, moved into that, quickly realized that I wanted to be back where all my friends were um, in what at the time was called the student ghetto. Uh, this is going way back. Um, but uh, ultimately rented that out to Carleton students, moved back to the student ghetto of University of Ottawa, and from there, uh, next year, I decided to refinance that, get another property. And then I really got distracted uh, with university. I say distracted. I got distracted with university and going through to get my designation as a CA, which now is referred to as a CPA. And uh, didn't do anything else with real estate until uh, eventually I transferred from Ottawa uh, to Toronto, downtown. You know, I'm from the, the greater Toronto area, so it's just a matter of time before I came back uh, to, that, uh, to Toronto. And with that, I sold my two investments in Ottawa and affordability took me to Hamilton, um, which, you know, was very eye opening. I saw this like city of opportunity and I didn't understand why my colleagues at the time were referring to Hamilton uh, jokingly as, um, you know, they, they would actually call it the armpit of Ontario. And I'm like, how, how is that possible? There's so much opportunity here. You know, my, my first year, um, with my investment, it actually generated 22% return uh, on just cash flow alone. And I, you know, again, light bulb went off, reminded me of that landlord back in third year university. And, uh, you know, how he seemed so relaxed, calm, collected, and he was a family man, all things that I looked up to eventually once be. Um, so at the time, I was uh, doing child labor with a public accounting firm. That's what I refer to child labor. You know, going in the office when it's dark, leaving when it's dark. Barely seen my friends and family. Uh, eventually switched into financial reporting for a public mining company. Um, you know, better pay, better hours. Um, at the end of the day, it was the same grind. And I was looking to start a family and, and really just focused on that passive income. So um, I did what everyone told me not to do. I quit my job. Um, I focused almost <laughs> made my girlfriend, now wife, uh, cry because we we're just crawling out of student debt. Uh, but I quit my job to focus on real estate. And, uh, you know, it's like, what's the worst thing that could happen? I'll fall back on my designation, maybe use, lose a year of seniority. And uh, really made that my focus and I never looked back. That was uh, 13 years ago. What was that first property you bought in, uh, in Hamilton? And uh, like you said, yeah, it was kind of the armpit of Ontario or it was referred to that by a lot of people. Um, 22% sounds pretty attractive. I don't know if that's might be impossible to find nowadays in, in Ontario. Um, but certainly that's attractive. There's, you know, um, I think you've told me before, what, 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 what type of cap rates were you looking at at that time, uh, in Hamilton compared and maybe even compared to like Toronto or Ottawa where you had looked previously? Yeah. Yeah. This is why I said it was just a city of opportunity. I couldn't believe it. Um, like I was looking at property that, uh, was 8% cap rates or higher. And, and this was when I started to, you know, I, I kind of summed up quite quickly, but there's a lot of research and due diligence that was done, you know, behind the scenes. You know, I, I come from uh, an accounting and analytical background. Uh, so I was really doing my due diligence and, and created a, my own financial model that fit exactly what I, you know, I was looking for. And um, my realtor at the time, before I got my own license, you know, I would send her my financial model and, and she'd go around and like look at 20 properties and narrow it down to like five. And I'd jump on a go train and go out to Hamilton and, and we'd just look at the five and narrow it down to one. 
But I was looking at properties that had like an 8% or higher cap rate, if you can imagine. Yeah. And so you think of like, why is someone selling something with an 8% cap rate? It, d- it did come with like a lot of headaches, right? Like uh, if such a great asset um, is being sold, it, you know, I inherited a lot of tenant issues, um, capital expenditures that were required. Um, you know, it's being sold for a reason. Um, so it wasn't easy, but uh, I was able to stick handle through it. So why don't we talk about some of those like challenges and, you know, what all those look like? Because uh, um, first of all, you, I, you know, I got to congratulate you on taking action. A lot of people that I, especially coming from accounting and like more analytical backgrounds, seem to have a bit of challenge taking action because they can, what do they call that? The um, uh, uh, information, what's it called? Anyway, they overload themselves with information and, right. uh, and they can't take action. So I think that's a very common theme with people that I've met that are, that are more on the analytical side. How did you overcome that, I guess? Or, and then what were some other challenges along the way? Uh, so I overcame it from trial and error. Um, challenges along the way were that um, really myself, you know, I try to do everything myself. Um, which in hindsight wasn't the best approach. You know, you always hear people saying you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I wasn't trying anything necessarily new here. People have done it before me. It would have been uh, optimal if I was able to find a coach that I could have uh, followed in their footsteps. But, you know, I went from sitting behind a desk being accountants to all of a sudden being the plumber, the the painter, the cleaner, the the tenant placement agent. Um, I was doing all things. I actually remember pulling an all-nighter, um, getting an apartment ready for someone that was moving in the next morning, and, and I'm picking up my mop and cleaning uh, material and walking out at 8 in the morning, and the tent's moving in, and she's like, Matt? Like, she thought I was just the agent that placed her there. Um, so it was kind of eye-opening. But, uh, you know, you learn along the way, and I, I do come from a, you know, construction background, actually. Uh, my father was a carpenter, so I grew up uh, around tools, so I kind of had that background. Um, but I would say, like... Uh, in hindsight, me trying to do everything myself um, was a bit limiting. Um, I learned a lot through it. I know those properties now inside and out because, you know, I was picking up the tools and doing it myself. Um, however, it's not a scalable approach. Um, and if I look back, I would, I would address, I would take that differently. So can you, can you take us a bit through the, 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 um, you know, from buying a property or two in Hamilton and the evolution of going from that to, you know, roughly where you are today with the funds and, and all that. And we can talk a little bit, kind of transition into what, what a fund structure looks like. But we'll, we'll get to that. But how did, he, how did he get to that point of saying, yeah, this, you know, fund, you know, bringing other people's money and pooling together and that sort of arrangement makes sense. How quickly did he develop that sort of thought or that strategy and that approach? And, and what was that evolution like from, you know, yourself solo to let's bring in all these people? Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, I said I, I quit my job. So, you know, I, I took it very seriously and I had to make this work uh, because at the end of the day, I had to, uh, you know, still pay the bills. Um, so I, I dove into it and um, put 100% into it. Uh, but I quickly ran out of my own capital. So the first three properties, uh, I figured out a way to, to acquire and finance um, on my own and, and also with the help of my wife, uh, you know, to get the mortgages and the financing. Thank you, Kristen. Um, but then subsequently, you know, I ran on my own capital and, and all of a sudden another light bulb went off, which was um, creating simple co-ownerships. So uh, my what first were those properties, by the way? Were those duplexes? Were they something bigger? What, what type of properties were they? Yeah. So uh, the biggest was a triplex, uh, duplex, single family home. Um, okay. And it was just because of price point um, and, and also the model that I was trying to achieve. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I acquired three properties, um, and then, and then didn't have the capital to do anymore. And I was wondering what my next steps were and just out of conversation with actually, uh, an old, um, boss of mine, you know, she said, Matt, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by what you're doing. I always want to get into real estate myself, but I don't have the time, energy or expertise to do it. If you're ever looking for a partner, I'd be more than happy to write a check and you do all the work. And I was like, well, wait a second, I could do this with other people's money and I'm not using, or sorry, owning the property hundred percent myself. Um, but that's exactly what we did. So, um, created a, a simple co-ownership, which, which, um, we clearly wrote out, uh, what I was bringing to the table and what she was bringing to the table. And then it, you know, gave me the, 
the, uh, the funds I needed to go and acquire another one. I'm uh, still following the same formula that was working for me. Um, and then from one co-owner, just word of mouth, um, through my network, it, you know, I ended up with six different co-owners, all slightly different parameters that they're looking for. But more likely than not, if I brought them an opportunity that fell into those parameters, uh, they're willing to write a check. And then one of those co-owners actually came from a legal background. And we had five assets together. Very grateful for the relationship. And he eventually took me aside and said, you know, Matt, like, this is great. I'm, I'm enjoying my investments with you, but let's turn this into a real business. And from his legal background, you know, we looked at all the different types of structures uh, that we could create and ultimately landed on a limited partnership. And with that limited partnership, I was able to bring my existing co-owners together um, under one structure that, you know, combining our forces gave us a larger buying power to go out and start looking at larger assets. Awesome. So we'll get into a little bit of what that fund structure looks like. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things, though, that came up in your in your your uh, your story there is because a lot of people that listen to our show, they you know, we get a lot of questions around finding money, raising capital. How do how do you do that? You know, uh, most people, when you start out, that seems to be the stumbling block. And then, as you know, you get a little more into it and all of a sudden that becomes actually kind of kind of the easier part. And finding the deals becomes a bit of a challenge um, at the time there. You seem to have not unlimited, but there's a lot of deals in Hamilton. Um, so that seemed to be maybe not the stumbling block, but you came across money seemingly by your story, seemingly by accident almost. Um, what do you think it kind of contributed to that? Was that just by luck? Was it um, something you were doing day to day that was, you know, attracting that type of uh, type of person to want to partner with you? How, how did that come, come about? Yeah. You know, if I, if I had to look back to it, you know, I came from a network of accountants, um, most of them were doing relatively well financially um, and in their individual careers. Um, but I, I again, just, you know, so focused on what they do best, which was their job. And, um, and uh, you know, here I am, you know, suggesting opportunities to invest in real estate, which, which most people, you know, without having a lot of knowledge on it, uh, tend to lean towards that, you know, real estate's a good um, place to invest. Um, so I guess like coming from a finance background, you know, just my network and word of mouth uh, started to connect me with certain individuals who are looking to invest in real estate. I didn't do any type of advertising or anything of that nature. It was just really, you know, got that one co-owner. She was happy. She's like, hey, you need to talk to my friend because we're looking to do something um, similar. And, and just from that, you know, I played on a mentally cocky team, with, uh, a bunch of physicians. Um, so there's some relationships that came out of that. And then, um, you know, the one co-owner that just came from a legal background, I actually met him at a wedding. Uh, so you just never know the people that you're going to meet and the opportunities that might come out of it. You know, I address uh, or I approach every conversation as if I'm going to learn something from that individual. And uh, once they ask me about what it is I do, um, you know, I just speak to it at that time. And those that are interested about it, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes results in a co-ownership. Awesome. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's great. I, this is a great um, story because... I think a lot of people really overcomplicate that. I think it's like a lot of it's going about your day to day and just, you know, who you're around matters, who you surround yourself with matters. So when you get inside the right groups and you hear, you know, you know, it, it does give you advantages to be in a, a career where there's people that have some, some wealth building there or some finance or whatever um, that matters. But then beyond that, I mean, you just got to look around for those opportunities they're kind of every day they're in your day-to-day -day. they're at your wedding that you go to they're at your whatever right they're, they're they're show up in different places but if you're open to it and you're and you're like just aware of those could be anywhere then you never know where you come across the right person yeah it, it was a hurdle i had to come i had to overcome because at first i didn't realize that these co-ownerships actually uh could exist um right and, uh, you know, also in hindsight, I really undervalued what I brought to the table. So I was like, wow, you know, they're putting in the majority of the money. Um, they should get the majority of the returns. Uh, but really it was, you know, me pulling those old nighters and grinding out and finding the right opportunities and the expertise uh, of me having boots on the ground that brought them, you know, above average returns on their investment. Um, so, yeah, I'm very grateful for the relationships that I've, I've created over the years. And uh, really, it's just this word of mouth and just taking those extremely seriously. Um, it all comes down to relationships in my world. And, and those are all based on a couple of core values. You know, one is trust. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I think I, you know, coming from a CPA background, you know, I always held my integrity to a certain degree. And uh, that really came out with my next, you know, life cycle in, in real estate and just never, never do anything that is going to have anyone question your integrity and just keep that at the forefront. And, and with that is your, you know, trust and transparency. And um, there was a couple of hurdles I had to come up, overcome. And, you know, there was an uh, easy way out. Um, and I never took that and just made sure that uh, no one ever questioned those those core values. And it's, um, I don't want to say it paid off, but it, it resulted in, in keeping those relationships. So, you know, someone asked me the other day, and, and I never even thought about it like that. But I, I've never had an investor uh, walk away from, you know, our co-ownership or our limited partnership. So it's been 100% retention, uh, which is a stat that I'm told them I should start telling people. Because uh, it just shows that you know they're they're happy and, and uh, content with the scenario. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's a, that speaks to uh, especially when you have a lot of professionals in there that are that are re- retained at one hundred percent. I think that speaks to the the quality of uh, service and integrity that, that you deliver. Yeah, yeah. When you're dealing with fellow accountants, I mean, they want to know yeah. where every single penny goes. And then you know, physicians aren't as I don't want to stereotype, but they're not as particular, but then lawyers as well. Uh, I mean, that's basically my network and um, attention to detail is a, is a must for sure. Yeah. Um, and were those initial um, co-ownership deals they put together, would they be like a 50-50 structure or was it kind of a variation depending? Yeah, I mean, it's simplifying it, but really it depended on the asset. So we would look at the opportunity and what we wanted to do with the asset and I would sit down with them and just make like a simple T diagram, you know, on a piece of paper with a pen, I'd say, you know, this is what you're doing. This is what I'm doing. And what do we think is fair here? And even though it was the same co-owner, you know, the, the allocation might uh, differ from property to property. Um, so it depends, you know, if a property required a lot of initial oversight of uh, capital expenditures, then they would say like, Matt, for you to oversee that and run that, it's going to take more of your time. And therefore, you know, we'd set up a, uh, a formula that made sense to acknowledge that. Okay. But we start with 50-50 and then sometimes that would vary. So in um, so you went from, from kind of doing yourself to the co-ownership and then through your one co-ownership partner there, decide to go mm-hmm. into this more GPLP type structure. Um, what other structures did you explore during that phase? Was there others that were on the table that kind of were considerations? Uh, was it like GPLP just made the most sense instantly or how did you get to that structure? And maybe just explain what that is because I'm sure a lot of our listeners really don't understand what that term means. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot of ways you can structure a deal. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people say joint ventures initially. So I say co-ownerships um, because there's a difference there. Uh, the main difference is how you can um, amortize the asset and, and where that happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, so going from owning the property myself to bringing in partners, having simple co-ownerships, and then bringing uh, co-owners together in a, a larger entity, we landed on a limited partnership for um, several reasons. But I mean, you could set up a corporation and that corporation goes out to buy properties. Um, but we landed with a And and there's a lot of ways that you can structure these deals. Uh, So I don't want to dive into each one of them, but we landed on a limited partnership for various reasons. Um, So what a limited partnership is, it's it's very similar to uh, a co-ownership in that you have someone that is um, the main decision maker and, you know, boots on the ground doing everything that's required to oversee uh, the property. And, And that individual falls in the role of the general partner. And then you have individuals that, really all they want to do and ask to do is contribute uh, funds, money towards the project, right? And those would be a limited partner. And why we decided to go with a limited partnership, which has the two roles, a general partner and a limited partner within a limited partnership, is uh, just understanding our investors, the limited partners. Um, They're able to invest in the property, but they have limited liability because they're not a decision maker Worst case scenario, which hasn't happened to date, is, uh, you know, they could lose their investment, but that's it. You know, if there's a major lawsuit or anything of that nature, it wouldn't come back to those limited partners. So that they're protected from those worst case scenarios, 
um, the, the worst thing they can do is, is just lose their investment that they put into the structure. Um, but if there's a slip and fall or something more serious happens and there's a lawsuit of some nature, they're protected from that. But as a general partner, I, I would take that on. Um, the other advantage is um, the limited partners aren't required to guarantee the financing. So it's a great structure for someone that wants to invest in real estate, but doesn't want to impact the personal debt to equity ratio. So, you know, if investors looking to save up and eventually buy a cottage or a second home, uh, their investments with us won't impact that when they go, you know, to their lender to try to get financing. It doesn't even come up because they're not guaranteeing that loan. Um, so that's another big one as the financing falls on the general partner. And then it's also a more direct route to the ownership itself. So, um, you know, if you set up a corporation that goes out and, and buys real estate and then the investors buy into that corporation in the form of shares, they really own a portion of the corporation and not the physical assets themselves. And so after talking with our investors, we realized that they want to have a more direct line of ownership uh, to the property. So um, this allows for that. So they actually own units in the property itself without uh, sacrificing their personal debt to equity ratio and also protecting them from those worst case scenarios, which ultimately, um, you know, it's, it's one of the most important matters when you're looking into these structures. Awesome. That's pretty clear and, and makes a lot of sense. Um, now, so what about, uh, so with this structure, you've been, how long have you had the, the uh, a version of this GP LP sort of structure uh, with the properties you've been buying? Has that been, uh, how long now? Yeah. So our first uh, limited partnership was established in 2017. Yeah. Um, and we've been uh, acquiring property in that structure uh, since. Um, but then from the, the you know, more a smaller limited partnership, we've stepped down into this fund, which is being launched in December, um, which again is just you know, when we stepped in from owning the assets as an individual into co ownerships, you know, then stepping up in that limited partnership, uh, a, a smaller structure of a limited partnership, and then stepping into a larger um, limited partnership of the fund um, is being launched uh, this December next month. Yeah, so uh, basically, pretty much as people are listening to this uh, and, and beyond, it'll be launched. So tell us about that. Why don't we transition into that um, with the new, maybe the new structure of the fund, uh, what it is, what it's called, maybe a little bit of how it came together. And, um, you know, what's so, what's so exciting and different about that than what you've been doing for the last, you know, five, 10 years um, in your other fund structures? Yeah, okay, so um, the fund itself is called <clears throat> Essential Real Estate Partners. Um, basically, what uh, how it came about was a lot of like-minded uh, individuals uh, with the same integrity, um, transparency, um, and experience uh, that we've been operating in the same space, um, you know, simplify it. There's even assets that we've been competing with each other on. And ultimately coming together to say, like, why, why are we bumping heads here, um, trying to compete on certain properties? Um, and we also have properties that are side by side in the same neighborhood on the same streets. Uh, why don't we align our forces here, um, come together, amalgamate, for lack of better words, and uh, utilize the efficiencies, bring our networks together, and, uh, and move forward collectively. And what, why it was a great fit for me is, um, you know, as we've talked about, you know, I historically I've wore many hats, uh, did a lot of uh, things myself. And with that, you know, there's some things that I do a fairly good job at and there's some things that I don't, um, but it was just me kind of carrying the whole thing. And then with uh, essential real estate partners, you know, I'm lining myself with other individuals that uh, are experts in their own, um, areas and therefore we complement each other and where I don't do the best job, you know, one of my partners does, you can really pick up that torch for me and just make sure that we're, we're being, um, you know, as efficient and effective and optimizing that opportunity in every single area of our business. Uh, so, so it's very similar structure. It's just bringing again, um, like-minded people together, um, and, uh, and moving forward. And, and with that, our network of investors, uh, larger buying power, uh, better management, which I think is crucial uh, moving forward, and um, and also deal sourcing. So, uh, like simple example, uh, like a month and a half ago, I put an opportunity, I put in uh, 
an offer on, a, on an opportunity that I thought I had my ear to the ground and, and saw it first. And uh, one of our partners in this file was like, oh, yeah, I saw that three weeks before you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that's just an example. Like just it's also bringing our connected uh, network and, uh, and, and, and deal sourcing, which is huge. So, you know, high level, I might have looked at 20 opportunities in a year and, uh, you know, selected a few that made most sense and the best opportunities are what I saw at that time. Um, but again, because I was wearing so many hats, I wasn't looking at everything. And so now instead of looking at you know, 20 opportunities in a year, we're literally going to be looking at thousands of opportunities a year and, and really just cherry picking those best opportunities to make sure that we're bringing the highest value to our investors. So by bringing these teams and these um, networks together, we're really in a position to therefore optimize um, the returns, and the value that we can bring to our investors. Awesome. Yeah. It's a uh, it, it, exciting thing to, uh, to, to be a part of. Obviously uh, we've got a great group of um, like-minded yet unique specialties uh, amongst the group to complement each other. That that's exciting. Um, you know, all of our, our listeners who have heard my story would know I'm not, a, I don't have the accounting background. I don't have the legal background that we have in our group, uh, multiple accounting backgrounds actually in our group. Um, so there's lots of, uh, lots of complementary pieces yet like-minded in, uh, in the way we, we do business and our, and our main core values. So, it's an exciting thing. Essential rep.com is where you can go if you're listening to this and want to check out uh, who's a part of our group in more detail and uh, and what that all looks like. I, I agree. Certainly, the you know looking at thousands of deals a year um, really brings the cream of the crop out there to the to the table that we can that we can look at and and fast move move fastly because you know when a great deal is out there, it doesn't last too long. It typically needs to be jumped on as quick as possible. Um, or someone else is going to scoop it up or find out about it and take action faster with our, with our group and our tools and systems we have in place that we can really efficiently go through that list of thousands of deals too and, and take the appropriate action, right? Yeah, yeah. actually, you just reminded me of something that I think is also uh, crucial um, to this new structure is historically in a limited partnership, what I would do is once I found that property, I got it under contract, I do all my due diligence and then once I was um, extremely comfortable with moving forward with that asset and comfortable with the financial model, the numbers that I put together, um, you know, I'd waive commissions and I put myself in this time crunch where then I'd have to put an investor deck together, put it out to everyone in my network and um, <clears throat> deal by deal, those investors would say, okay, Matt, makes sense for me, uh, you know, a prior investor and, and they would contribute to that with, uh, with the fund, we're raising the money up front, or we shouldn't say raising the money, but we're getting commitments up front. So we know that we have access uh, to that capital. And then when we go out and we find the opportunities, we can really pull the trigger with confidence, knowing that we're going to close that. There's going to be no issues. There's going to be no delays and really be able to jump on those opportunities, which I am a strong believer just going full circle and back to when I entered the Hamilton market and 2010, I think that we're really stepping into a similar market uh, in 2023. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity where you can see those higher cap rates, um, or if they're not closing with those higher cap rates, there's an opportunity to, to still create that value add. Uh, so ha to have those funds committed up front and allow us to really uh, jump on opportunities as they present themselves, um, I think it's going to be beneficial to everybody. Uh, and so... I, I, there are listeners. No, I don't do a whole lot of selling at all on this, uh, on this, uh, on this platform. Um, we are talking about a fund that we're pretty excited about and being a part of, I, I do recommend anyone who's interested, wants to learn more to go to essentialrep.com. Uh, you can book a call right in there with us. If you want to chat with us, uh, deeper, learn about what this looks like. Um, I would say we're on the, our, our, our target, um, uh, our target number, uh, to just, to deploy a target amount of capital to deploy is uh, is, a, is an exciting number. I think it, it gives us an opportunity to diversify quite well across uh, the table of the type of assets that we look at, and um, it is some pretty I would, I would say big opportunities that are exciting. Uh, so our target there is two hundred million. Do you have a um, do you have a pr prior? I guess you were looking at a bit smaller numbers, but in what's the value of being a part of a larger fund, I guess, for an investor who's looking at doing something uh, in this space, investing with us or with another fund, what would be the advantage of being a part of that bigger, bigger number is what it really is today, but ultimately translates into a bigger diversified pool of assets, right? 
Yeah, I think you just hit it there. So it's that diversification within real estate. So, you know, there's many different asset classes within real estate. There's many different opportunities um, that are available within real estate. Um, so when you have a larger number to work with and a, a larger buying power, uh, you're not limited um, to to uh, proceed with these opportunities as they present themselves. You know, one thing I, I realized, and I used to say that I'm, I'm fine with hitting singles and doubles as a baseball reference all day long and, and did that and very grateful and, you know, still have a portfolio of single family homes, duplexes, triplexes. Um, but when you're able to put more doors on a run roof um, in one location, there's a lot of efficiencies to be had there. So, um, you know, once our limited partnership got into larger assets, we really saw that. Um, and, uh, and, and when you get into larger assets, you can, you can capitalize on that. Um, but the fund itself, it's, it's really for people ask like, who would, who'd want to invest in a fund like this? And after a lot of thought, you know, it could, it could be anyone, it could be ultra high net individuals who want to invest in real estate, but don't have the expertise, um, the resources, more so the time to put into it, to do it themselves, or they do it themselves and they don't optimize it because they have day jobs, right? They're, they're not like bringing it up to its highest and best use per se, because, you know, they're focused on a different um, day-to-day job, but it also allows those smaller investors who might not have the means to do it on their own to also own a piece of larger assets. You know, we have, we have investors that would never be able to own a 15 plus story building on their own, but when they invest in the fund, that gives them an opportunity to actually own a percentage of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so really it's, it's a wide spectrum of investors that uh, might be interested in something like a fund. Um, and I mean, I obviously have a bias towards real estate, but uh, I'm all ears to other opportunities out there and assess other opportunities all the, all the time. It just, it always brings me back to, uh, to real estate. And specifically, I really enjoy uh, or have an appreciation for multi you know, Coming through a pandemic, um, you know, you really see that uh, people value having a house, a roof over their head. Um, if you look back in time uh, through the recessions that uh, we have lived through, uh, multi-res is an asset class that is proven to do fairly well compared to other opportunities. So I think I answered your question, but a fund is, is really out there for, for anybody, in my opinion, um, that wants to, you know, have real estate in their portfolio. And, and one thing I've seen through my uh, existing investors, um, especially coming out of the pandemic, is that they're, um, they're willing to allocate more of their net worth to real estate um, and give up the small heart attacks they had uh, with their stock going up and down. Um, so it's just got to be the right fit for you. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, and so can you speak a bit to the maybe, and I agree, multi-residential, there's a, a severe shortage of housing in general in Canada and in Ontario, uh, especially in Ontario. Uh, and we're kind of targeting kind of these secondary markets, I'll call them uh, for the most part, mm-hmm. which have lots of opportunity to grow. I, we, I know you and I are still both, pretty all in on Hamilton, but there's some other great markets too that are emerging that are exciting that we're looking at pretty, uh, pretty closely. Um, but what are some of the, what are some of the, maybe the risks or maybe the advantages of like today and the market we're in, which is different than it was six months ago or a year ago. Uh, and, you know, markets are always shifting, but we kind of say that we're in this shifting market right now. That is uh, a bit of a, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot, shifting a lot faster than we have seen uh, over the last five years, at least in, in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. what are the advantages of that? And what are the, maybe, maybe if there are any added risks that come into play and, you know, what should an investor be thinking about? I guess this is probably a global kind of a, a question, not really necessarily just for our fund, but in general, how should people be addressing the market and taking action accordingly? Yeah. So you touched on a lot there. Um, <laughs> When we're saying like shifting market and uh, risks, you know, I really conclude that that's a lot of opportunity. Um, so in my opinion, to be, you know, a part of a fund, again, that has those committed funds up front, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity that presents itself, a lot of opportunity that we seek out, uh, where, where maybe people are looking to divest part of their portfolio because all of a sudden their interest rates have gone up, for example, and, um, you know, they're having a cash flow issue. Um, or, you know, it just doesn't make sense for them anymore, or they want to put their money elsewhere. Uh, those people that are looking to get out of the market, you know, they're going to be selling their assets, maybe at a better price point for someone that's looking to buy, 
than um, you know eight months ago to a year ago or, or further. So um, I see a lot of opportunity with that. It's kind of why it reminds me of when I first stepped into Hamilton. And you're right, I keep referring to Hamilton because that's where I started in the greater Hamilton area. I still think is a fantastic market, but we do look at everything across Canada. Um, there's a lot of uh, secondary markets um, that we focus on outside of Hamilton. But um, yeah, I, I really equate that to a lot of opportunity. Um, but with our financial models um, and how we analyze these things is with, um, we, you know, we proceed with absolute caution. And in doing that, you got to make sure that you are budgeting for, you know, uh, interest rates where they are today, where you think they're going to go. We're just ultra conservative with that. And, you know, in a value add fund, you're not just looking um, to acquire a turnkey asset, but you're adding value through better management, through making a building more efficient. So a lot of, like most of our buildings, the first thing we do is come in with an energy audit. So everyone focuses on trying to get rents higher, uh, but saving money is making money as well. So if you can reduce, you know, the gas expense, the hydro expense um, by having a more efficient building, you know, that really helps with your bottom line as well. Um, so I'm kind of rambling on here, but I, I think it's a, you know, a lot of opportunity that's going to present itself, which is why I align myself with a fund that is going to have, you know, the commitments available up front so we can jump on those opportunities. And, uh, and then you just have to be, you know, ultra conservative and, um, and, and let the numbers speak for themselves. Don't try to force a deal. Uh, because you get your emotions into it and you just think it's a great asset. You really have to let your financial model and the formula that's worked for you in the past, you know, you're just going to repeat on a formula. You don't want to really deviate from that formula. So you got to have a lot of self-control to make sure that you don't, you know, take on too much or step into an asset that really is, is uh, riskier than what you're comfortable with. Yeah, I think that's well said. Uh, self-control can be a big, big thing in this business. Uh, and I, I always think of it as to sum all that up. I think of being short term, uh, a short term cautious, long term optimistic. And I know we're long term, we're a longer term sort of play here. Anyways, we're a value add fund that takes some time to develop. It's not a quick flip uh, type of scenario where, yeah, it really matters what the interest rates are in a month or two months from now or six months. Um, where we have a longer timeline, we can we know we're going to add value. We know in five to ten year time frame you know, I, I would feel very optimistic with the Canadian real estate market in general, um, even more specifically the ones, the markets we're targeting. So um, yeah, short-term yeah. cautious, long-term optimistic. That's kind of how I think of it. And that's pretty much how I've thought about real estate ever since I've been in it. Um, and the only time I've ever had any challenges was thinking, was when I looked at some flips or things like that, that I thought were short-term plays and you just never know. The market can shift pretty fast. So yeah yeah well said i wish i said those words um yeah i mean when you're when you're flipping real estate to me that's a whole different game um you, you know there's a lot of speculation there and uh you know when a market shifts you know all of a sudden you can be in a negative position so flipping real estate isn't something that's attracted me in the past uh, it's always been long-term wealth creation um so when you model out 10 plus years it's a lot of <clears throat> excuse me it's a lot different than you know six months to two years Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know how people can invest with us. Again, they can go to centralrep.com. Um, they can also, we'll have your contact info as well uh, after or we're done here and in the show notes. Everyone knows how to reach me. Um, we're definitely looking for, for more awesome people to collaborate with on this. So feel free to reach out uh, about this. And if you want to be an investor, you want to bring some sort of other strategic value that you think you, you might have, then uh, we're all open to that. And uh, we're really looking to, to have some fun with this over the next uh, bunch of years and grow something special. So um, we would urge you to reach out to us and chat to us if you have any, any thoughts or ideas around this or, or want to uh, invest with us. Uh, Matt, what about for those people that are listening that are not going to maybe do this with us, but they might want to do this on their own. What's maybe one suggestion you can give them? Because I know there's probably you know hundreds. What's one suggestion you might, might have for someone who's thinking about doing a fund like this for themselves? I, I would really uh, get them to challenge themselves on the why. I mean, one of the first questions you asked me was, uh, you know, the trials that I had initially, and it was because I tried to do everything myself and I didn't want to reinvent the wheel and just coming full circle to that. You know, someone who's looking to start a fund on their own, uh, that's great. I encourage you to do it. But I, I'd want to 
them to really understand why they think that they can go out, <clears throat> excuse me, go out and do it on their own. And, you know, maybe they think that there's a, a value add that they can provide that uh, our fund or an existing fund doesn't already, um, you know, provide. And, and if that actually encourages them to, to contact me, I want to understand why, uh, because maybe we can just align ourselves. Um, I, you know, ton of due diligence, make sure you have all the right relationships. Um, you know, I, I spoke to relationships with bringing sources, but also, I mean, when we are looking at financing a deal, um, we get underwriting from the lenders themselves and, and not just, you know, when closing, but what they're expecting uh, years to come when eventually we might refinance it. Um, but if I had to sum it up to someone who's looking to step into this for the first time or grow their business to be at a stage where we are, I mean, I, I've been doing this for 13 years. Uh, collectively, our group, I think we have 95 plus years of experience. We, we've been through a lot. If, if someone out there is looking to, to do something similar, uh, I, I want to understand why. Um, maybe there's an opportunity to align themselves with us. But um, again, kind of that's, a great point. that's yeah. a great point, actually. If, if, if someone's listening to this and they go, I, I want to do this myself, I think we should chat because I think maybe there's a way that uh, we can either – we can definitely help them in, in terms of guiding them on what the next step should be. Um, beyond that, we, there, we've, I've certainly come across a lot of opportunities in the short time, um, you know, this year kind of working through this and, and setting all this up that has kind of led to conversations that you wouldn't have expected just because um, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to setting up the funds, a lot of legal, you know, hoops to jump through. There's a lot of corporate structures, all these different things to set up that, um, that I've learned a lot about this year. Uh, and, uh, and we all collectively have a lot of experience around that uh, now or prior to this. So certainly we can help out, but there's also lots of opportunities to, to align and work together. I think that's one of the best things about real estate is there's, there's so many ways to work together. And the people that are in this for the long haul um, generally like to help and work together and, and find ways to, to uh, provide mutual win-wins and value and, uh, and all that. So we're, I know, I'm sure you are. I know I am definitely willing to help out and have some, conversations with people around that yeah i mean again very grateful for the relationships i have and even though i, I couldn't find myself a coach that i could really look up to and want to follow um and trust me i was i was looking for one uh, but it was very specific and what i was looking for and i couldn't find the right person um, but along the way there's many people who who helped me and you question why they would help me, but there, there's so many opportunities out there. It, it's really not taking opportunities away from them. Um, so I think uh, real estate is an industry, an, an industry where we collaborate and we help each other. And anyone who has questions, I'm more than happy to give my insight and help them along the way. And um, not a problem. But if, if someone's looking to start what we have from scratch, I, I, I truly want to understand why. Um, to, you know, not reinvent that wheel. And maybe there is a way that we can work together or, you know, we just help them out and guide them. Perfect. So um, let's leave, uh, for those of you who maybe don't reach out to us, or maybe they're not ready to, or, you know, you just listen to this and, and this is your first time ever listening to our show. Um, what was it like, like to leave people with, with one piece of advice? So what's one of your, your you know, kind of great insights or pieces of advice or knowledge that has stuck with you that you've learned over the years? that you could share with our audience uh, here today. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> it sounds silly to some, but I think the best exercise that I've ever done is create a vision board. So it really forced me to look at where I want to be in two years, three years, five years, 10 years. And I sat down with a piece of cardboard um, and created a visual that actually um, mapped out, you know, what my goals and objectives were and why am I picking up the phone for this and why am I engaging with this person? And <clears throat> then to place that somewhere that you see it every day um, really made me focus on ultimately what I want to do. And for me, that was creating family day every day. That is my sense of financial freedom and retirement is that I can be engaged with my family and be present as much as possible. And I did this exercise, I think seven or eight years ago. I still have the board uh, in my home. I pass by it every single day. And uh, I think that's been the biggest thing that helped me uh, stay focused on the path is, is creating that vision board. And um, when it was first presented to me to do it, you know, I was at a real estate conference and someone got up and, and spoke about doing 
uh, vision board and, you know, I was at a round table and I, you know, I, I just took it for what the person said, but I didn't put a lot of weight on it. And there's this gentleman sitting beside me who leaned over because I, I think he didn't see me get as inspired. And he goes, I have a thousand doors. I'm like, wow, this guy's got a thousand doors. That's a big number. And he goes, and the best thing that I did was create a vision board. And uh, I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. And I, at first I had it in my office and then I literally secured it to the ceiling above my bed so that every night I looked at it before I went to bed and every morning is the first thing that I looked at. And he goes, I just built the house. I didn't even realize it, but the house that I built was identical to this house in the background of one of the pictures. And it's like just the psychological of seeing that vision board every day uh, really helped me. Um, and I took that seriously. And uh, I created my own vision board. And to this day, I have it. Uh, sometimes you modify it because life changes. But I would, for my one piece of advice, I'd encourage uh, individuals to make a vision board. Well, you told me uh, in a convo the other day that uh, I think it was by 35 or so that your original vision board, everything was already yeah. done on it. <laughs> yeah. 35. So, I mean, that speaks to the power of it right there in a, in a short time frame. Just that visualization. I think that's inevitably kind of directs you towards the results that are that are in that vision and uh mm -hmm. it, it kind of gives you the motivation day to day to take action around getting to to that you know whatever's on that board so i think it's as simple as, as it is and maybe even kind of cheesy to some people um super valuable yep i agree awesome well thanks for that lots of stuff shared here this has been fantastic lots of uh things we've we haven't talked too deeply on on our show before so Grateful for you and, uh, and your time to join us here today. Uh, thank you. And how can people, we've talked about it, but maybe give the best way to reach out to you. And uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of people that want to ask questions and, and everything around how you set this stuff up. How do they do that? Yeah, Sandy, thank you for having me. Uh, people want to reach out. The best way would be email. Uh, that's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at Essential Rep, E-S-S-E-N-T-I-A-L-R-E-P.com. Perfect. Uh, I encourage everyone to reach out to Matt's and, uh, and take any of your questions his way. And uh, again, you can always reach out to me, uh, Sandy at freedomreps.com or find me on social media. Uh, it's Sandy McKay on Instagram or Facebook is easy as well or LinkedIn. Thanks everyone for joining us. That's a wrap and have a great day.